for joining us today on Around the Peninsula. I'm Maria Soraya. We are very excited today to welcome you back in to the Point Vicente Interpretive Center. Now, PVIC has been closed for over a year due to the pandemic, but the city of Rancho Palos Verdes has been very busy making it safe for everyone's return. Emily, we are here back at PVIC. It's, you've reopened your doors. Tell us about the safety measures that you've taken to reopen to the public. So our safety measures that we have implemented are all in compliance with the LA County Department of Public Health um, protocols for museums. So some of the things you'll experience from when you walk into the front doors, we have signage that states, you know, if you're experiencing any symptoms of COVID or are under any quarantine or isolation orders, we ask that you do come back on another time to have your visit here. Um, there's other safety signage throughout the museum that reminds folks, you know, make sure you're wearing your mask properly, you're staying six feet apart from other parties um, and other things like that. Um, we also also have hand sanitizer dispensers spread out through the exhibits and as you enter and exit so we're keeping everyone nice and clean um, so there's a lot of things that have changed and really we're just looking forward to having more people back inside here we noticed that the store is not opened yet so tell us about that and when it might reopen so I believe maybe in a couple of weeks we might reopen. We're kind of gradually easing into this as the staff get for, more familiar and the patrons get more familiar with the protocols and things here, then we plan on opening the gift shop. Um, again, that has a whole nother set of measures that are required by the LA County Department of Public Health. So we'll be looking to implement those and we're looking forward to opening the shop again. We noticed there's somebody sitting outside of PVIC. Tell us about that. So that is our welcome kiosk. And the goal of that is we put a reservation system in place um, so when folks come in, we're just informing them of the safety measures. We make sure we take down their information in case we need anything for contact tracing. Um, but we are welcoming walk-in um, walk-ins as well. Okay, and so how do you make a reservation? So to make a reservation, if you go to rpvca.gov slash pvic, on that website, there's a make a reservation button. You click on that and then you can select which day you wanna come visit, what time slot is the best for you. Um, and then you just fill out your information. It's a one stop shop. You put everything in on that page and your reservation is made. It's very user friendly and it has different safety messages as well, just to kind of confirm that, you know, the visitors know what to expect when you're coming to the site. Okay, and then I noticed that you know you have a lot of uh, younger people that come into PVIC, and you've got a welcome video. Tell us about that. So our welcome video, we partnered with you guys, RPV TV and the Los Serenos Docents Puppet Program. And so this is really kind of a fun and joyful way to get that safety message across to remind folks wear your mask properly, you know, wash and sanitize your hands and make sure you're staying six feet apart from other parties. Um, so it's really a good way to engage the younger visitors when they're coming in. It's kind of fun and friendly. And so we're looking forward to people just enjoying that. And it's just a unique way to kind of present those informative topics that you need to let the public know. Know of. Okay, and then as far as the docents, are the docents on site now for guests or how is that working? Right now we are only offering self-guided tours, so we will be looking to bring the docents back. Once restrictions kind of ease and things improve with COVID-19, then we'll have our docents back giving full tours. We also see a lot of, in previous years, a lot of whale counters on the patio. Are they back? So they have decided to suspend their census for the rest of the year, which would have been through about the middle of May, um, just because of the different safety elements. And they really need a full crew to do their operations. And with having, you know, outdoor gatherings, there's still limitations on number of households. So they felt at this time, it's just best for them to reconvene in December of 2021. Okay, and then um, parking sometimes is an issue here. I know that there is a shuttle now. Tell us about that. Yeah, so there's this awesome, it's a pilot program right now, I think for 90 days, it just started last weekend, um, but the shuttle program, if you park at RPV City Hall, mm -hmm. they will do various stops throughout the city, and one of the stops is here at Point Vicente Interpretive Center, so it runs, I think, between 8.30 to, I think the last one is, you can get on at 5 p.m., um, so it's a great way to get dropped off to various destinations, such as here in Abalone Cove and a few other stops they have, so we definitely recommend giving that a try. Um, the weekends especially can be a little bit more congested here as far as parking space and traffic goes so that's just a great thing to offer to the community and we're going to show a video shortly um, but you have new displays and new things for people to look at tell us about that 
Yeah, so one of the wonderful things is while we were closed, we capitalized on that 13 month closure and we were able to open up and install our new exhibits. Um, so we did a feature on this for our virtual whale of a day. And these exhibits were really on behalf of the Los Serenos de Point Vicente docents. They completely funded the fabrication of these exhibits. So it was an awesome thing to get done um, during our closure. A lot of times people like to touch things. Are you, how are you sort of encouraging guests to not touch things because of the sanitary part? So we have disabled some of our interactive elements here at the site. There are a few that you can still interact with, um, but we did put hand sanitizer dispensers located next to them and also the signage that says, you know, ensure that you are sanitizing before and after touching any objects or surfaces. So um, some of the elements were easy to disable, but some of them are a little bit more challenging that we couldn't physically remove the lift the flap or, you know, push buttons. So we made sure we put those sanitizing stations in the side close to that to ensure that we're keeping the public safe. Okay, and then also we noticed that they, you got the, the plexiglass uh, up here. So when people ask questions, that's also a safety barrier. Tell us about that. Yeah, so that's a safety barrier for the public and the staff as well. So um, that really helps just kind of keeping everyone safe. And we also make sure that our um, HVAC system is always running during our operating hours. And that's really been what the county has said is really effective against you know aerosol droplets in the, in the air. So um, just keeping that constantly running and helps the air quality in the facility. For you, what's it like to see people back here at PVIC? It's exciting. I think we all have been looking forward to this day, so we're just happy to be able to see people and interact again. That's really what we do here when we just want to share and like having the new exhibits that are featuring, you know, gray whales and birds and migration and navigation. It's just a pleasure to be able to come see people complimenting us and enjoying those new displays. Lastly, um, are you allowed to have groups back in here yet or not yet? The only groups we can have is party sizes in the same household up to six people. So we don't have any group tours or larger than six members in each individual party. So the best time to probably visit PVIC if you're looking for a more relaxed experience and kind of not have more um, visitors here in the park and in the museum, I would definitely recommend coming Monday through Friday. Although we are open every day, that includes Sunday through you know, Saturday. Um, 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. is our business hours. So again, we do recommend going online and making that reservation at rpvca.gov slash pvic. Um, note that we do close the reservations. So uh, every day at 5 p.m., the reservations for the next day would be closed. So if you didn't get a reservation, you can always give us a call and we can let you know um, what slots we have available for walk-ins. But on the day of, and especially during the weekdays, it's a little bit more easy to facilitate walk-ins. So we'll just take down your contact information and then, you know, if you choose to spend 15 or 30 minutes, you know, you have plenty of time on a, on a weekday to come and experience those plays. That's a really good point as well, because in addition to inside and outside, the views are so incredibly beautiful. I'm sure that people really want to enjoy it for as much time as they can. Yeah, exactly. I mean, on the weekends, we get thousands. I mean, even up to like 6,000 people in one weekend here. So just us kind of being an all-inclusive destination, not for just hiking and walkers and just the views and enjoying a picnic. Um, so there is a lot of foot traffic coming in here. But again, we're just looking forward to having PVIC finally open for the public indoors and so they can enjoy that experience. And when you come back into PVIC, you will see an amazing new display in the museum. Now we got a sneak peek, so we're gonna share it with you. Hi, I'm Paul Port, and I'm a docent here at the Interpretive Center. And I thought I'd give you a little preview of what you're gonna be seeing today. And the first panel is talking about the world in motion. And the world in motion is really about how we as people and animals need to migrate and move because of climate, because of water, because of food, and because of habitat. So we're always in motion. So then this first display really talks about that really well. And you can see that we have the animals and the insects that are on, always in motion. Now, if you pan up to here, you're gonna see, this is part of a sailing ship that came through here probably in 1540 about, even though this is not original. But you can imagine the local people that lived here 13 to 15,000 years ago to see a ship like that coming into the harbor 
And if you pan through, you're gonna see, you're gonna notice the California currents, and the currents really impacted how people came to this area because the only way that they could get here virtually in the beginning was either on land or in light boats or canoes. Now, what's special about this area too, coming through here, is that they used birds, clouds, currents, stars, cross staff, and chip logs, amongst other things in order to navigate these waters. Um, the first people were here around 13 to 14, maybe 15,000 years ago. And they pretty much lived off the land here, but they were locally nomadic and very interesting because they would go basically from food source to food source depending upon what went on in the year and what, what the climate was. And one of the key things that the coastal communities like the Tovimungas and the Chowingas, um, what they would trade, they would trade abalone for acorns that were mostly in the inland tribes. Now one of the interactive things that's good here, we tried to basically replicate an old world compass. Even though this is not a real compass, but what it does do is you rotate around, you're gonna notice that a little surprise as the North Star lights up in the far corner. And as you come around further, you're gonna see the UR here, which is where we are standing, lights up. And then as you come a little further, you're gonna see the phases of the moon down here light up. So it's a, it's a bit of a surprise and um, something that the kids I'm sure will have fun doing the spin around. So now and the other thing that, that we wanted to basically put a calendar of who lived here and sort of what transpired at different times. And the original people basically you could see lived here and they worked and lived off the land and the ocean. About 70% of all their food source came out of the ocean with the, with the communities that lived here originally. And when we talk about communities that the size of the community could be anywhere from 30 people to 300 people, typically. And so the, the tribes or the communities would trade with each other depending upon what they thought might be valuable for not only the health and well-being, but decorative. Now, here's one of the first key years is 1542, Juan Cabrillo navigated these areas. So this is the first time that the Spaniards came through here and made contact with the first people. 1602, Sebastian Vizcaino came up from Mexico and basically traveled through the islands and the shorelines all the way up to Monterey. 1790, George Vancouver, he names Point Vincente, which is where we are. And if you go all the way down to the end, you get the SS Dominator, which you'll see here, basically crashed off into the rocks outside of Palos Verdes here. And under the next section, we're looking at the Sky Riders. And the Sky Riders are really the birds that fly overhead on this Pacific flyway that comes by us. Now, you gotta, you gotta understand that you're gonna get billions of birds that migrate every year across the US. And we have a group of birds here that are very interesting. And you can see that we have anywhere from Herman's Gull to the Spotted Sandpiper, Black Skimmer, all the way down to the Wimbrel. And you're gonna see these on this coastline. What's interesting about this is also that we give you an opportunity to learn a little bit more about the bird, the spotted sandpiper that you'll see. You'll also get a sense of what the actual egg size is. And you get a little bit of the story in the bobbling, wobbling gait distinguishes the spotted sandpiper. And you get the same kind of story with the black skimmer, egg size, and a little bit of info. And going all the way down through. Now, one of the little known facts is the fastest animal in the world is a peregrine falcon. It can dive, when it's diving for prey, it goes more than 200 miles an hour, which is pretty amazing feat, if you can imagine. And part of it is, it has lightweight bone system, and it, it is incredible to watch when you see it off the cliffs here at Palos Verdes. The next section we're going to be talking about are the ancient mariners. The ancient mariner is the 30 million year old gray whale. 
not actually 30 million years, but has been traveling this waters for over 30 million years. And they've been going that 10 to 12,000 mile journey every year from Alaska down to Baja. And um, it's a pretty amazing kind of feat when you think about it. They spend three to four months up in Alaska area and they eat and get fat, really fat. And then they don't eat again, except maybe nibble now and then as they travel down the coastline. Now typically off, off our shores here, we can spot anywhere between three to 4,000 of these gray whales coming by every year, either heading south or going north. Um, but it's a very interesting animal because it is adapted to these waters and it stayed in these waters. They were endangered for years, but now their population is back to over 25,000 and probably more. Just that's in the Pacific area, right, right along the coast. Um, now, what we're gonna see are some of the pictures of the gray whale. We have them spy hopping, which spy hopping is a very unique kind of thing that we're not sure exactly what they're doing, but we're thinking that they come up out of the water and sort of check things out and see what's going on. Then you can see where they breach and they're gonna go airborne. The gray whale typically doesn't do that, but it'll do it once in a while. And if you check out the skin on these things, you're gonna see the free ride that other animals get with the barnacles and the lice. And then you can see there's the mother and the calf that are born travelers because they're going north to south or south to north constantly. And then you see, you can see the humans down here always checking them out, especially down in the lagoons in Mexico. Now as we move across, you're gonna see a baby here that has a little bit of the barnacles starting to build up, but not that much. And here's mom and calf as well. Now the 12,000 mile trip is pretty interesting because they'll go through, there's counts going on all up and down the coast in San Francisco area as well as here. And so they get a pretty good idea about how many are coming through every year. The other thing that they've done too is they've been able to identify the gray whale by its fluke, its tail. Each one is unique in and of itself, is like a fingerprint. Now, for the last and I think one of the most fun panels that we've got is the superpowers of the gray whale. And what's really interesting is that uh, I think most people don't realize that the gray whales swim about three to five miles an hour constantly. And you start to think, well, how do they rest? How do they do that? And one of the best ways for them to do that is by switching half their brain off. And so they rest basically part of their body and then swim with the other part, but they're still keeping their radar senses as in danger and they're constantly in motion. So they reduce the stress on part of their body while it's half asleep. Now, the other thing that I really like about this too is it's really difficult to get a feeling of what it's like to actually touch a gray whale. I've been lucky enough to do that. So we created an opportunity for kids especially to get a touch. And so you get this soft sort of rubbery surface and then you get these barnacles. And the barnacles are, are along for that free ride and actually uh, they, there's also a lice, an orange lice, that gets attached to the gray whale as well. And it doesn't harm, but it's, they are cohabitating. And so they get from one area to the next together. Now, the other thing that's really interesting, we do have an actual gray whale skull, but some of the sounds that they make when they talk with each other and when they're trying to get around, If you were underwater, you would be able to hear some of these sounds. It's pretty amazing. Now, each whale species has their own set of sounds that they use. Now, the other thing that's different about the gray whale is it being a baleen whale, it doesn't have teeth like the sperm whale. So what it does typically when it eats, especially in Alaska, it'll dive down at a slight angle and it'll scoop up the sand 
and catch the amphipods, which is like a little shrimp-like character, and scoop it up into its mouth and filter the sand out of this baleen mouth, keep the food inside, and all the sand and water go out through the baleen. Now, you're gonna see this eye travel with you. They have stereocopic eyeballs on either side of their heads, and, and what that really helps them do is judge distance, and it also keeps, keeps the surround around them. They're aware of any danger. I hope you've enjoyed this brief tour today. I know when you can see it in person, it's gonna be the most fun. I said, one thing that I think is probably true for all of us, especially the docents, is we wanna make sure that we protect our environment and the habitat that we live in. We wanna make sure we can pass that along to our children and our grandchildren so they can enjoy it. So everybody out there, make sure you do your part. Take care of this planet. And that will do it for today's show. Remember, if you want more information on the Point Vicente Interpretive Center, you can go to the website at rpvca.gov slash pvic. I'm Maria Sorreo, and we'll look forward to seeing you around the peninsula.